Hello, everyone. My name is Ellen Wedemeyer, formerly Rossiter, so we're currently adjusting to my new married name. And I'd love to welcome everyone to my lecture, but all moms pee when they laugh. This is a lecture about the different types of incontinence and how to help. I just want to make a note that this is the lecture that I did last Tuesday, but there was a little recording snafu. So I'm re-recording so that we can put this on YouTube and people can kind of um, come and, and learn from it or maybe review the lecture again. That being said, if you did watch my initial lecture, this one might be a little bit different just because sometimes I kind of, I speak whatever comes to mind. So hopefully you'll get something new and, and we won't be missing out on anything that happened in the original lecture. So let's get started. Maybe. There we go. Since we don't have anyone doing our lecture right now, that's okay. So we'll get right into it. What is urinary incontinence? Basically, it is any time that there is any loss of bladder control, whether that's a little bit or a lot of it, Basically, if you dribble, if you pee without meaning to, that is urinary incontinence. And before we get into kind of the whys and hows of physio and how things are related, we need to know about the body. So this is our anatomy. If you see my uh, little arrow here, we start with the kidneys. The kidneys are our filtration system of the blood. So all of our blood goes through the kidneys, goes through a whole bunch of little archways here, lots and lots of filtering so that we can get any waste products or excess of anything out of the blood to be removed from the body. Once it, uh, basically once the waste products have been filtered out, they will go through the ureters, which are these long tubes all the way down to the bladder. And then the bladder starts to fill with whatever kind of fluid or waste products have been taken out. Now the bladder starts kind of small and then it stretches out. And this is perfect because we don't need a full big bladder there when, when things aren't full. But it also means that we need these stretch receptors to tell us when our bladder is getting full. So those are in the walls of the bladder and they basically talk to the brain and tell us how full things are getting. And they're supposed to communicate to the brain when it's time to go and pee. Now, what's really interesting, and I didn't remember it in the initial lecture, and I should have looked it up this time, but I believe it is 60% and 100% are when those receptors actually communicate with the brain and tell us that the bladder is full. So we get to, it'll fill, 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 fill. We won't really feel anything. Then we get to that 60%, and that's our initial kind of urge to go to the bathroom. That's the first time we go, ooh, I kind of have to pee. Then... For a lot of us, I'm sure you can think of a time where you really had to pee and then all of a sudden you didn't have to pee anymore. So you kind of kept going with whatever you were doing and then you had to pee again. That's because you hit that 60% mark, your bladder talked to your brain and then you were able to kind of keep going until it was full, full and then it's really time to go. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go forward because that has to do with some of our issues. Now, once it is full and it's time to empty, then the detrusor muscle, which is a muscle that's also in the wall of the bladder, will contract to help push the urine out of the bladder through the urethra to the outside world. Now you can see that the male urethra is going to be a little bit longer because it has to go through the entire penis, whereas for female, it's just this tiny little tube uh, basically between the bladder, which is just above your pubic bone, and then out to the outside world. So urinary incontinence is fairly common, but never normal. So about one quarter of women, and I believe these stats are taken um, in the US, but it, it's quite similar across North America. One quarter of women experience urinary incontinence in their lifetime. And 85% of all urinary incontinence cases that we know of that have been reported occur in women. So it's definitely more common, more prevalent in the female population. Now, age does factor into it a little bit because we see that young adulthood around 20 to 30% of um, cases and then elderly is 30 to 50%. But you can still see that young adulthood, that is your 20s and early 30s, we're still seeing 20 to 30%. So this is something that does affect people kind of across the entire lifetime and is not just something for older women per se. On that note, one in nine men 
people experience urinary incontinence, which is actually a really large number of people. If you think about it, think about um, your last big family get together. If there's nine people, if there's 20 people, that's one or two of those people could have urinary incontinence if they were men. So it's still quite significant. Um, the big thing is that only one in 12 actually see healthcare workers. Now that is because for a multitude of reasons, but a lot of it is either embarrassment or it's just something that isn't talked about within friends or family members. Some people don't realize that it is a treatable thing. They just kind of like, oh, I, I had a baby. Now I pee when I jump. That's the end of it. And so that's why we see a lot of people not pursuing um, opportunities to get better because they don't even realize it. Big note on the bottom, many people think that this is inevitable and that is absolutely not the case. Even if it is common, it is never normal to have incontinence. So always thinking that it does mean that there's just a little, a little catch in the system somewhere, whether that's your core not working appropriately, whether that's a bladder thing, that there's something going on and there's a good chance that it can be improved if not resolved. Now, risk factors that can be considered when we're looking at any kind of urinary incontinence include obesity that just has to do with um, well, many things, but one of the big ones is mass in and around the bladder can play a part. Um, and then we have postmenopause. So there is a large hormonal component for many people. That's why generally we'll see some incontinence kind of pairing with um, menopause, but again, common, not normal. Um, pregnancy and birth, we usually hear it from moms um, and any kind of birth trauma will increase the risk. So that is including vacuums or forceps. Um, if there's tearing, if they have to cut uh, episiotomies, then we think of surgery, just general surgery, but especially in the pelvic region or, and we'll talk about it later, um, anywhere that doesn't allow people to actually get to the bathroom. We'll see chronic illness. There's a lot of systemic illnesses that do have a bladder or bowel component, um, as well as medications. For a lot of people, they'll start new medication and all of a sudden um, have a lot of urgency or incontinence. And so if that's the case and you've started a new medication, it might be something to look into and talk to your doctor about. Um, smoking is big one just because it's irritable on the system and chronic straining. That's what I wanna talk about. And that has to do with bowels. So if you are consistently straining to pass stool, that actually affects the, well, number one, the ability of the pelvic floor to do its job because you're consistently pushing, 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 where in, instead of just having a relaxed um, pelvic floor, and so it teaches the body to push through potentially a tight pelvic floor. Um, it also has to do with where kind of bladder and bowel fit in relation to each other because they're quite um, close. So anyone who has chronic constipation, usually that is the very first thing that we try to resolve. Um, whether that's going to be a naturopath or your doctor, or if you know that something tends to trigger constipation for you, trying to remove that, because if we can take out that strain, then frequently we'll see some improvements. All right, so we'll get into the types of incontinence. There's five kind of main types that we would categorize. They're kind of umbrellas under that giant incontinence umbrella. So what I'll do is just be talking about each one individually, and then we'll talk about kind of treatment plans and whatnot after. The first two are the most common that we see, especially in clinic. So number one is stress urinary incontinence. This is the big one. This is the one that everyone kind of thinks of. This is when you are peeing, when you laugh, cough, jump. Um, sometimes people have it with exercise. So if they are doing heavy squats or skipping rope or anything like that, and a big one is transitional movement. So that means when you're moving from one position to another, it could be when going from sitting to standing, it can be getting out of the car, which tends to be a big one for people, um, getting out of the bathtub, anything like that, where you're kind of transitioning from one position to another, that is all going to be under the stress urinary incontinence umbrella or SUI. Now with this type of incontinence, it generally involves a small amount of urine. So you're not seeing that entire bladder emptying, if that, those are your dribbles. Those are the ones where sometimes to, you know that you have to wear a pad to work out, but you're not quite sure exactly when you lost it. Um, those kind of things tend to be within stress urinary incontinence. 
and it has to do with what we call decreased urethral closure pressure, which is a tongue twister. So if we think of that urethra, which was the tiny tube from the bladder to the outside world, we have uh, sphincters, we're able to close that urethra um, unconsciously, um, but also consciously with the pelvic floor. And so if we have decreased um, pressure and ability to control at the bottom, but we're increasing pressure from above and that bottom isn't able to match the pressure that's coming down. For example, if you think of the pressure that builds up when we cough or when we sneeze, if the pressure keeps coming down and we can't match on the bottom, it's just gonna keep coming down and any urine that's in the bladder is gonna come with it. Now, to, to make that make a little bit more sense, we have this, this not concept, but this, the way that the abdomen works is intra-abdominal pressure. And I will be talking about this in a future lecture. I believe it is my next lecture, actually, where we're associating the pelvic floor with the low back. And that is because the, the low back, the pelvic floor, and our abdominal wall, they all come together to create this intra-abdominal pressure, which is always there. We, we're supposed to have steady pressure within the abdomen, and it helps us to stay upright and to stabilize. And it is it results from interactions between things in the abdominal area. So as the diaphragm comes down when we breathe, we should also see the pelvic floor coming down and that's gonna create um, an intra-abdominal pressure which then forces the different muscles to activate. So it's kind of, you can see in here, we have things rising and then we have to, we have to match any kind of tension that is coming from the pressure. That wasn't the best explanation, but basically the, the way that the muscles are working, they will be more active if we have the appropriate pressures. If we don't have the pelvic floor strong enough to resist that downward pressure or it's not activating the proper way, then we're going to see that you're in kind of going through that pelvic floor. Again, there's going to be a full lecture on that. This is something I can talk on forever, and it's hard to, to put into a, a few sentences or less. All right. Now, the pelvic floor is very, very much involved in stress urinary incontinence, and that's why we see it most commonly in clinic. And this has to do with potential weakness of the pelvic floor. Um, a lot of times, it's actually poor endurance. Some people, when we assess, it'll be very strong initial contraction, but then we lose it right away, which isn't helpful if you know that you have to do a coughing fit or you tend to sneeze in threes. You might be able to hold for the first one, but not necessarily after. And a big one that I see quite frequently is actually the strength of the front of the pelvic floor versus the back of the pelvic floor. So actually, this is a good kind of depiction. So we have our pelvic floor muscles on the bottom going around this little urethra, that's the tube to the outside world. So when the pelvic floor muscles are nice and strong in the front, then they're able to maintain that nice closure of the urethra. If we have any weakness, then uh, it's going to allow the urethra to open, especially when we have that downward pressure. Now the muscles that are in and around that urethra are going to be the front of the pelvic floor especially for women, but it goes for everyone. We tend to have a stronger posterior or back of pelvic floor because we're frequently um, trying to hold in gas or something to that effect. So we tend to squeeze those guys a little bit more. And it also has to do with some positioning stuff. So if the front isn't strong, even if your general strength seems okay, if the ones that you actually need to work for that urine incontinence, if they're not working, then we tend to see a little bit of that in comments as well. So front versus back to the pelvic floor. Uh, one of the major, major ones is any poor connection with the central stability complex, which is what I was just discussing with the diaphragm, the abdominal, abdominal wall, and the deep back muscles in the pelvic floor. If the pelvic floor is not working well with everything else, we will generally see some kind of incontinence, especially any kind of pressure related. So that has to do with positioning as well as everything else. But if our pelvis and our ribs aren't positioned to allow us to use our diaphragm and our pelvic floor, then sometimes even if it's incredibly strong, if we can't use it properly, then it's really no help to us. So that has to do with it as well. Um, there's also coordination. Sometimes you're really strong, but you're just, your body isn't connected to those areas. So sometimes it's a connection issue as well. 
Okay, so that was stress urinary incontinence. That is was the one that most people kind of think of. Now we have urge urinary incontinence. So before we even get to the incontinence side, we have to talk about urge. So urge is basically that feeling of, oh my gosh, I have to pee right now. That, ah, I got to find a bathroom immediately. So that urge is, is normal sometimes. Everyone has a little bit of urge. But where it becomes an issue is when it is happening frequently, um, if it's forcing us to pee all the time, or when we have incontinence connected to it. So urge urinary incontinence is when we have that urge, but we also have a little bit of urine escape, either at the same time or because of it. So it's our inability to delay. We feel it and then, oh my gosh, we have to go right now. We, we can't get to that bathroom in time. So this, unlike stress urinary incontinence, where it's usually a small amount, can be a large amount of urine as well. So it could be a little dribble, it could be a full release. And sometimes that's just because the bladder just, it goes before we want it to. So urge urinary incontinence tends to have a habitual component. For example, and this is a big one, it's a really common one, is turning the key in the lock. So you might be coming home from work, you don't have to pee, you're driving home, you don't have to pee. You get home, you walk up to the door, you're still good. And then you stick that key in the lock and you turn and all of a sudden your brain is like sending red alarm signals. We have to get to the bathroom right now. That is urge. And it, that is kind of the most common. It might not necessarily be a key in the door, but there's some trigger. There might be when you pull into the driveway. It might be when you get into the house, but you drop your purse off or you drop your grocery bags off or anything like that. There's frequently a habitual component where your brain doesn't matter if you peed right before you left or you hadn't peed in three hours, it always tells you that you have to go. That is urge. So I do kind of encourage anyone who's listening to this to go and think about, is there, is there a habitual component sometimes to your need to go now? Now, another one is incontinence in the bathroom itself. And so for a lot of people, they feel the urge, they're able to control it, they get to the bathroom, but it's when they are undressing or trying to get to the toilet within the bathroom that they end up with um, either some dribbling or this is a frequent one where we see that full release of the bladder. Like It's like your brain sees the toilet and it's game over. So both of those are kind of in that urge urinary incontinence umbrella. Now, there's also a very strong pelvic floor involvement with urge urinary incontinence. And that is actually both weakness and tightness of the pelvic floor that can play a part. So with urgency, again, that's that, oh, I got to go right now. That is frequently associated with actual tightness in the pelvic floor as opposed to just weakness. So as the pelvic floor gets tighter, then it, it tends to create those different signals to the brain. It affects our, uh, our bladder's ability sometimes to expand. And so we can see that tightness increasing how frequently we have the urge, how severe the urges are. Then the incontinence side can sometimes involve weakness. So if you have a tight but weak pelvic floor or you have a pelvic floor that is weak because of tension, then we can sometimes see that inability to control it when you're going to the bathroom. So with the pelvic floor kind of side of things, we tend to be treating multiple things at the same time that are very much related, but sometimes have a few different processes to go through. All right, those are our two major ones that we tend to see in clinic. We'll talk about the other ones too, just so you're aware, because this might be what you're experiencing, or it might be what someone you know is experiencing. So the next one is overflow and contact. So this is basically where the bladder is unable for some reason to empty normally or naturally. So what happens is you just think of it as a cup. If you keep slowly pouring water in, which is what's happening with those kidneys, those kidneys are always filtering and sending waste products down. If you are consistently pouring water into an already full cup, then something's got to give in it. It's going to start dribbling out over the sides. That's basically what happens with this, except it's through the bottom, through the urethra. So this tends to be related to comorbidities, to um, 
already diagnosed issues. Um, Parkinson's is a really common one. Diabetes can be the case because uh, you're unable to empty properly. Stroke is a big one because it has that neurological component. The body may physically not have the correct um, communication with the bladder at that point or the muscles around it. And radiation can be a common one, um, as well as some cancers in the area. Sometimes there's surgical complications. There's a bunch of different medical reasons why this could be the case. Now, what we generally see with this is just a constant dribble. It's not necessarily a full emptying of the bladder since that's generally the issue to start. And it will sometimes increase at certain points of the day. It could be related to when you're eating or drinking, but it's generally that just constant dribble. All right, the other one is functional incontinence. And this is a very large umbrella, but it's basically anything that is not allowing someone to get to the bathroom the way that they should be. So we'll have um, cognitive impairment, whether that is a developmental cognitive delay or impairment of any type that doesn't allow someone to understand how to toilet or um, does not want to toilet. Uh, sometimes people can have functional incontinence sometimes and could be completely fine other days that's still within it. So that's the, the functional incontinence kind of side of things. There's also other cognitive impairments like neurological issues or medical conditions like dementia. Now, this is quite common and also completely heartbreaking. I have dementia in my family and, and it is incredibly hard to watch someone go through it. And there is a lot of different kinds of functional incontinence throughout the progression of dementia or something similar. Because oftentimes to start, you might have some issues because they felt the urge and, <clears throat> sorry, got a little tick. So they have, may have felt the urge to pee and recognize that, but then um, got distracted or thought of something else or something like that. And, um, were then unable to get to the bathroom in time. Later on, it may be that they are unwilling um, to go to the bathroom if someone is trying to force them to, which again, you can't really blame anyone for not wanting to be forced, but um, they're not cognitively aware enough to, to get to the bathroom on their own. Um, and then later on, it's functional incontinence in that they, they likely don't even feel that urge. It's just something that's happening completely separately, completely naturally. Um, so lots of different kind of impairment dementia is just an example. There's a lot of different conditions that can be similar to that. Physical function is another one. And I mentioned this previously when we were talking about surgery, but sometimes surgery physically does not allow someone to get to the bathroom. They might have um, a cast that's hard to deal with and they're not able to get it off in time or they are unable to get to the bathroom in time because it takes a while for them to move. Um, broken hips and pelvis are a really, really common one for that, but other surgeries can absolutely be the case. It doesn't even have to be in that area. If it's preventing them from getting to the bathroom, functional. Then we also want to think of environmental barriers, which is something that we tend to overlook, but for some people, um, they might have a lot of stuff in their home um, that is kind of blocking them, or they may have tripping hazards. And so they're doing fine, but then they trip before they can get there. And so maybe they're worried about going in that direction, but we're unable to clean it. Um, there's also issues sometimes economically where they maybe had this wonderful working toilet that then broke and they're unable to afford to get it fixed. And so then they're holding it, holding it, holding it, trying to get to work to pee or get across the street to someone. And maybe they have some dribbles or a full leakage as well. So any of those, you can see the functional incontinence umbrella is huge. And so if someone is unable to toilet for whatever reason, they are absolutely under the sun umbrella. Now, what I'm gonna be talking about with the urge is that generally you don't wanna be peeing just in case, but for some of these conditions or situations, um, timed toileting can actually be really handy. Um, very common with dementia patients, but it could be really for anyone where you're actually going every two hours or every three hours or every four hours based on how your body is. Um, that way you're able to prevent an incontinence episode and kind of protect dignity and that kind of thing. So there are definitely ways that these things can be treated or, or improved, but they're a little bit different than what we're doing 
in clinic with pelvic floor. Okay, number five is basically just the mix of stress incontinence and urge incontinence. So it might be someone who gets that urge and can't quite make it to the bathroom, but also they pee when they laugh. And so this is quite common. Um, we actually see stress incontinence is the number one most common, then mixed, then urge urinary incontinence. So a lot of people who have that urgency tend to also have a little bit of that stress incontinence mixed in. All right, it's a fun little comic there. So treatment. Now, there are a lot of medical treatments out there. Um, some of them have good science behind them, some of them not so much. Still need a little bit more research, uh, including laser. Um, there's definitely some mesh um, and bladder surgeries. Those frequently as are associated with uh, more prolapse, but there's, there's so much out there. So if there is a serious, serious issue, um, there's also medication, then those could be things that you're talking with your doctor about, or I can help you as well. But what I'm gonna talk about is what the treatment plan would look like if you were to go in and see a pelvic floor physio. Now we're all a little bit different, but this is kind of gonna be the gist. So before any kind of treatment, there's always assessment. And especially for me, the assessment starts with a very long conversation because there are so many different factors that can play a part in your incontinence that you probably didn't even think of. Um, for example, one of them is your bowels and digestion, right? That we talked about before. So. You don't usually think of that when you're like, oh, I'm peeing myself, but there is so much going on and that conversation is really important. So that's what we would start with. Then we go into a physical assessment. Now, the first part of a physical assessment, depending on your situation, um, has a very high likelihood of being external. So that is gonna be looking at your positioning. I mentioned it briefly, but your rib and pelvis positioning are really, really important for how you're able to use your core and your pelvic floor. So we'd be looking at how that is looking, um, connection to your core and breathing. Are you able to breathe with your diaphragm? Are you able to feel your pelvic floor at all? Um, and don't worry if you can't, it's not something we tend to check in with, but it would be part of the assessment. And uh, I threw diastasis recti in there. That's basically an assessment of your abdominal wall and if there's any separation especially those that have had babies um, or at least carried babies, we can sometimes see a separation of those six pack abs that are kind of right down the middle. If they separate a little bit, that affects our ability to use our core, which can affect our, our ability to use the pelvic floor. Not necessarily a terrible thing, but it just gives me an idea of kind of what we're working with. So there will sometimes be an abdominal assessment as well. Then we would go internal. Now the internal assessment I always try to go as slow as I can and explain as much as I can. And I'm pretty sure any other pelvic floor physio is going to be doing the same, but we're going to be assessing tension of the pelvic floor the same way we would assess any other muscle in the body, whether that is the hips or the calves or the shoulders. We're trying to see how the muscle is responding to touch and if there's any protective responses or is it just tight or is it nice and loosey-goosey and tension isn't the issue. Then we would assess strength. And strength is assessed in a multitude of different ways, but basically we're trying to get the, uh, the picture of what's going on strength-wise. So we're gonna be looking at a basic contraction, a maximal contraction, quick repeated contractions. Are you able to fully relax that pelvic floor after a contraction? Um, can you contract and hold it? So that endurance component or with those repetitive ones, how long can you do those repetitive um, pelvic floor contractions? and looking at left versus right and front versus back. So really just getting that beautiful picture of what the heck is going on with that pelvic floor and does it go with your symptoms? Because sometimes it absolutely does and sometimes it doesn't. So then you have to dig a little bit deeper. Then since we're in there for everyone, I will always assess for prolapse as well. Um, my previous lecture that I believe is on the YouTube channel, um, is about prolapse, but basically in two sentences or less, prolapse is where the, uh, an organ is basically descending or coming in towards that vaginal canal, at least for pelvic organ prolapse. And so it might be the bladder or the, um, sometimes it, it's rectal or bowel, um, and sometimes it's uterus. Wait, what's the third one? 
And so we can see upon assessment if we are having any descent of those organs into the vaginal canal. And sometimes that can absolutely be affecting your incontinence. Sometimes it's just a random other finding that isn't really the case and isn't really a bother, but I'm always gonna assess for that just to see again, whole big picture. All right, then your treatment is going to be based on your assessment. And this is why it's, it's really tricky because I wish I could just tell everyone like this is going to be the treatment plan so that everyone can get started, but everyone's treatment plan is so different for any of my patients. I'm constantly writing out everyone's homework because every time I try to make a sheet, it fits one person and no one else because everyone's so different. But basically, if upon, upon assessment, you have a lot of tension in that pelvic floor, that tightness, then you're going to be looking at stretches. We can stretch the pelvic floor the same way we can stretch any other muscle group and conscious relaxation. So that is going to be a very kind of specific road that you're going down. We're trying to be able to relax that pelvic floor consciously and then help it to relax unconsciously. When you're stretching, not only the pelvic floor muscles, but the hips, the back, anything else that could be related, the abs um, can be stretched and sometimes need to be. Then if it's more weakness-based, you're gonna be looking at strengthening um, and endurance work. So we're probably doing both of them, sometimes one and then the other. And you're going to start with it in a really easy position. You're going to be on your back where your body doesn't have to hold you up and you can just focus on that pelvic floor um, with whatever different exercises we're doing. And then you're going to go to more difficult positions. So then you're sitting, then you're standing, and then being able to do it with functional movements. So then you're going to squat while doing your pelvic floor contractions, or you're going to be doing core work with your pelvic floor contraction. So kind of moving along in that direction. Now, whether you're tight or you're weak, we're going to be starting you on breathing because for almost everyone, we have lost that connection with the diaphragm and the pelvic floor and, and our ability to stabilize appropriately so that we're not creating that downward pressure that the pelvic floor just can't stand up against. And so we have that kind of incontinence component. So everyone's going to start with breathing. My husband makes fun of me because he's always like, well, did you start your new people on breathing today? And I'm like, yes, yes, I did. Because it is so important. All right. Then along with your physical exercises, the same way you would have with any other physio, we also have really important education pieces. And that's because most of us don't really know about our bladder. We, we've not taught about it in general school or you, there's minimal pamphlets in the doctor's office. So based on your specific situation, there might be a conversation about um, position for how you toilet. There might be something about um, how often you're going to the bathroom or when or where you're going to the bathroom and what we can change. Diet can be a really large component. There are irritable foods and drinks to the bladder. So kind of looking at those. Um, exercise. There's uh, Exercise is fantastic for the bladder. So if you're not exercising, it might be something that we start to do. Walking is exercise. So it might just be some, some basic kind of movements, but it also might be pulling back on certain exercises that are just aggravating the issue, at least for now, until we can get you the appropriate stabilization. So there's so much education involved in it that's always gonna be part of treatment as well. And then we have bladder training. So bladder training is kind of an umbrella term, lots of umbrella terms today, but it's basically our way of loading the bladder, so drinking lots of water and training it to understand when we are at 60% versus 100%. Training the pelvic floor to be able to be in the correct position with the pelvis to be able to hold things until you get to the bathroom. Um, trying to train the bladder that we're not peeing every 20 minutes. And there's so many different kind of, again, situation specific things but they all will be our way of training the body to do what we are hoping that it can do. All right, so what can you do right now? And this is what everyone always listens to lectures for is what can I start right away? And even though, like I mentioned, everyone is so specific, some people are tighter, some people are weaker, some people have stress incontinence versus urge incontinence, 
these are a few things that would be safe for everyone to try or at least be aware of um, to start to get control of the situation right away. So first one, our habits. So if you take nothing else from here, or if you tell your friend only one thing, it is please do not hover over the toilet or pee in the shower. So we want to be training the body that it only releases urine when we have relaxed the pelvic floor. So we want to be fully seated. It is impossible to relax that pelvic floor appropriately while hovering over the seat because we're using all of those surrounding muscles. We want the, the body to feel that full body relaxation when it is time to urinate. So please, as gross as some toilets are in public areas, just put toilet paper on the seat or something. Um, please, please try to make sure that you are fully relaxed so that we're not training the body to push through a tight pelvic floor. Same with peeing in the shower. We're already standing up. So trying to make sure that we are peeing before we go in the shower. Um, another one is to avoid just-in-case peas, which means um, just going because you see a bathroom and you're not sure when the next one will come or peeing every single time you leave the house. That's a big one because like we learned the bladder is very habitual. And so we don't wanna train it that we have to pee every single time we leave the house or there's a problem because it will create that urgency. So try to make sure that you're not peeing for no reason, but I'm not saying not to go pee. Like if you have to pee, then go. But we're trying to just make sure that that is when we're heading to the bathroom, not whenever we see one. Last one, always walk calmly to the bathroom. And I laugh about this one because I have 100% been guilty of this where you do, maybe you come home, he goes into the lock, we start to get that little urge that I talked about before. And then all of a sudden you are like running across the house, your jacket is half off, you still have one shoe on, you threw your purse, who knows where, and you're just trying to get to the bathroom and it's just pure chaos. That is not helpful that does not allow the body to use the muscles that it's supposed to be using, that creates this panic response with the body. So it's just using whatever the heck it wants. It is just not good and it creates a new habit. So we always, no matter how urgent it is, no matter how crazy and alarm bells are going off in the brain, always try to walk as calmly as you can to the bathroom. And that goes for taking off our pants as well trying your best to just turn around and calmly remove your clothing, um, you will thank yourself in the long run. Another thing is for you to just kind of analyze your day, figure out what the heck is causing this. Because for some people, they only get incontinence after coffee or um, after, again, key in the lock is just such a classic one, or it only happens in the evening versus the morning, just kind of looking at your day. and trying your best to take out those things at least short term because while you're trying to get control of everything. So if you know that you're all good except for jumping on the trampoline, maybe we take out the trampoline just for now until you can kind of get things sorted and then you can go back into it. So you don't want to be continuously irritating that bladder either, right? And aggravating it or creating a worse situation for yourself. So just something to think about. I'm not asking anyone to change their life, but if there's a really obvious thing that you've never really noticed before until you actually think about it, then it might be something that even if you can control that, sometimes that's enough, right? You don't even have to go see a pelvic floor physio. If you're willing to take out coffee, for example, and that's the only thing that was causing your problems, then hmm, found a solution. That's great. Um, on that note, there are multiple bladder irritants. Um, these are just four kind of common ones. Caffeine, carbonation is one people don't think about. Um, alcohol, I'm sure a lot of people have experienced that on a night out drinking. Um, and tomatoes is also an unusual one that can be a bladder irritant. So those are just a couple, but just looking and seeing, hmm, do you tend to be more incontinent after a certain meal or after your morning coffee or after you have a can of Coke or anything like that? Um, cause again, it's just, it's just information and you can do with that information what you want, but it's always nice to have more information than less. So this, I just had to put in here because it's super important. Please don't stop drinking water. 
if you have incontinence, the first thing that's really tempting to do is to just stop drinking. And you think, you know, it's not in there. There's nothing that can come out and ruin my day. But the issue is that those kidneys continue to filter whether you have water or not. So they're going, and then that, the waste products that is coming out of the blood are going down the ureters to that bladder. And all you're doing is creating a really, really concentrated urine. The more water we drink, the more water gets filtered out and that actually dilutes the urine in the bladder. The urine, um, like the, not the toxins, but basically the waste products can be actually very irritating to the bladder. So there's a greater chance of initiating the contractions in that, that bladder wall a little bit sooner or a little bit earlier. And so if you just give it a whole bunch of irritants and you don't dilute them at all, there's actually a greater chance you're gonna have to pee more, which is really frustrating since you took out the water for a reason, right? So what you wanna do is, and a lot, I know a lot of people are asking for specific guidelines and it's really, really tough. Um, and this was a question in the lecture as well. Generally, we try to go for those 64 ounces, but which is eight cups, but sometimes people need five or six and sometimes people need 10. So I recommend checking out um, the, the actual color of your urine. And again, this was noted in our Tuesday lecture, but sometimes if you're taking supplements that can affect the color of the urine and that's where you're gonna wanna try to just consistently sift throughout the day. Um, but if you're not taking any supplements and your urine is undisturbed, then we want to stay in a more pale yellow range. If it starts to get really yellow or heaven forbid, very dark, you have to start drinking more water because it is dark because that is just irritants. That is just waste products. And so you're going to actually be increasing your chance of incontinence at that point. I'm not saying to chug water before bed, that probably won't be super comfortable or nice in the middle of the night. But if you just at least continue to take some sips throughout the evening, then you decrease that chance of the, the irritation and the buildup of the toxins. All right, so to summarize this presentation, there are five different types of incontinence. The most common that we see are stress urinary incontinence, which is that any type of pressure, um, and urge urinary incontinence, which has to do with that, oh my gosh, I have to pee, and then just not quite making it, um, and the mixed version of those where they're two together. Incontinence can be related to tightness, weakness, it can be habitual, and it very frequently has to do with poor coordination between the pelvic floor and the rest of our central core, which is our diaphragm, our abdominal wall, and our deep back muscles. If you take nothing else from today, try to just take control of the situation. Your bladder has probably taken control and we need to get that control back. So stay calm, stay relaxed, try to, to walk calmly to the bathroom all the time and only be peeing when we're in that relaxed state. Please continue to drink water. That's a big one. Again, you don't need to be chugging it at unfortunate times, but just even sipping throughout the day is gonna to help to dilute that urine. And uh, I just don't want you to go down the wrong path by stopping the drinking of water. And the biggest thing is everyone's treatment plan is really different. I love when people talk, there's so many people that come to see me and they're like, oh, I told my friend about this. And like, that's really fantastic but sometimes what helps one person um, can be completely different for someone else. So please just uh, watch out that you're not necessarily just doing Kegels or anything like that. Everyone is so, so different and every treatment plan is so, so different. But I'm here, if anyone has any questions about it, please feel free to reach out. On that note, um, this is my contact information. So we have the, that's the clinic number. So if you wanted to call Active Sports Therapy and just let them know that you're calling for Ellen. If I'm not with a patient and I'm in the clinic, I am more than happy to take your call. We can obviously just have a quick conversation or a little longer conversation just so I can answer some questions or anything you need. Um, that's also my work email under there, ellen at activesportstherapy.ca. Please feel free to reach out if you have questions. This is a topic that a lot of people have never talked to anyone about. And I would love, love to help anyone, even if you have a quick question on whether pelvic floor therapy would be appropriate for you. Let's talk that out before you have to go see someone, right? So 
please use that contact information as you need. I am here for you. And I hope that you were able to at least get a couple little nuggets of information from this. And you can learn how to start to take, take control of your situation at home. All right, thank you everyone and goodbye. <laughs>